Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hey there, YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Look, you saw the last two, I saw the last two. If you didn't, go watch them. I'm hungover because of an absolutely terrible day before recording this. Let's just jump into it. This chart is telling you that on the far left there, that black area, that's a groundhog type animal. And that supposedly over millions of years, it had mutations and that it evolved into the top. It evolved up into the hippopotamus and down at the bottom, the giraffe and the cow. So I promise that that chart is not telling anyone that a rodent evolved into even toad ungulates. That evolves into a hippopotamus? Let's, let's just do the hippo for one second. Look, we can do it with any of those. But do you know how thick a hippo skin is? I mean, off the top of my head, I can't give them measurements, but there's a reason that they were put in the now defunct class of Pachydermata, that is, thick skinned animals. Their skin is quite thick. A hippopotamus has skin that's up to two inches thick. That's their skin, it's up to two inches thick. It's not fat. When you cut the skin, you'll see it as white. That's their skin. And inside that skin, they have a tiny gland that secretes a clear substance that when it hits the surface of the skin, it turns red and drips down their body. Why do they need that? Because think about this. They get sunburned just like you and I. Everyone ready for someone to pretend that hippos being unique among artiodactyls makes them not artiodactyls for some reason? Huh. They live in Africa. Not a good place. You get sunburned, easy, right? No, that 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 substance that turns red. You'll hear you'll hear people say, "Well, hippos sweat blood." They do not sweat blood. It's called blood sweat, but it's not blood and it's not sweat. It's a clear substance, turns red, drips down their body, and it is a sunblock. In addition, it's an antiseptic. Point being. Hippos don't play nice with each other. They bite each other. They've got cuts and all. If you look at hippo skin, they've got all kind of scars from bites. They secrete an antiseptic sunblock. We can't even go to CVS pharmacy and buy an antiseptic sunblock. And they secrete it and it came from a groundhog? Yes, they secrete it and no, it didn't come from a groundhog. No one is telling anyone that hippos descended from groundhogs. I don't know where he got that from, except perhaps pulling it from deep within his mm. You're free to believe that, but don't jam that down my throat like that's science. That is absolutely science fiction. Can we jam it back up where it came from? And here's a good one. This is at the Smithsonian. Oh, looky here, looky here. You, the dinosaurs. Oh, they prove evolution. I mean, dinosaur diversity from the Triassic until today provides lots of nice examples of evolution, but I wouldn't say that on their own they prove all of evolution. No one lineage does that. Evolution is supported by the consilience of evidence from all forms of life, experiments, fossils, the twin nested hierarchy of genetics and morphology, confirmed predictions, etc. Note to the young earth creationists in the room, you have to make testable predictions and then test them and have them confirmed. Just testable predictions aren't the quote-unquote gold standard in science. It's confirmed testable predictions, which are different from competing hypotheses. You don't just look at one group of organisms and then declare that they prove evolution on their own. It, do you notice something that there's all little tiny black lines and none of them connect together? What this chart actually supports. It's the duration over which the listed taxa are known to have persisted in the fossil record. Here's one more. Here's one more. You start in the middle and you've got this uh, mouse. Dude, mouse is already on the outside ring of this chart. It's a lie to call the common ancestor of Boreoeutheria a mouse when mouse is listed as an actual descendant of that common ancestor and not the common ancestor itself. Like, if you're gonna lie, that's one thing, but pro tip for the liars out there, don't put the thing that proves you're lying up on screen. In other words, this is worse than pulling a Kyle. By the way, if you come with me to the Smithsonian, I'll be better able to explain essentially everything than he is. I can introduce you to this mouse. She's called Morgie, or he, whichever. Uh, it's a two and a half inch long mouse with a tail. Get rid of the tail. You got like this inch and a half inch long mouse. Morgie, as in Morgan Nucodon? I mean, that must be what he means, as it's the only prominent animal I know of on display with a name that could fit, and that's about the right size in the Smithsonian. 
Problem is that Morganucodon isn't even close to the ancestor of all Euboreal eutherians. It's not even a mammal. It's a mammaliform. It laid eggs. It probably wasn't warm-blooded. It's known from the late Triassic until the middle Jurassic, whereas molecular data suggests that the common ancestor of Boreal eutheria existed towards the end of the Cretaceous, as in Campanian or more likely Maastrichtian stages of the Cretaceous. Honestly, when he said this, I had to walk away from my computer and straight outside. This level of incompetence or dishonesty, or both, is simply unconscionable from someone in a position of teaching authority. Oh, and again, it's not a damn rat or a mouse. You can't just use those as words that mean any small furry thing. Rodents are highly specialized and derived mammals that have almost nothing in common with Morganucodon besides being small, furry, and making milk. That supposedly over time evolved into everything that we see, including the blue whale. No, Morganucodon is not the common ancestor of mammals, or at least it's almost certainly not. What it is, is something that exemplifies the anatomy that was predicted for such an organism, and so is an example of what that common ancestor quite likely looked like. You think Groundhog the Hippo is a tough sell? I do, which is why no one is selling it. Try getting an inch-long mouse to turn into a blue whale. Oh, just given enough time. Not a mouse, but yes, the morphological transition between primitive insectivorous small mammals all the way through to artiodactyls to whales is pretty well established. There are no outlandish steps. It is no more remarkable than asking to see a house built from a pile of wood and nails. Sure, the initial steps don't much resemble the final ones, but there's nothing magical or unbelievable going on. And we've got the chart. There you go, Carl. You start down at the bottom with a couple of meses. Basal mammals or boreo eutherians. Not mice. Although at this point, it's not clear what we're talking about. I'm sorry, that's plural for mouse, right? But you got a couple of them, and given enough time right circumstances, they have the mutations and you get all the different mammals. Stating the firm conclusion of science inaccurately and in an incredulous tone isn't an argument. That proves evolution. What are you going to do? Except the overwhelming preponderance of evidence and the universal conclusion of experts. You know, the kind of thing a rational person does. I'm going to get rid of the dashed lines. And you know what the evidence actually so shows? That the dashed lines should be there, and getting rid of them was stupid. Now, many people have said, but Carl, all you're doing is beating up evolution. You're not giving us any evidence for creation. He's not even going to do that. To do that, he would have to actually start talking about evolution as it's understood by science, and not his absurdist strawman of it. All right, I'll tell you what. Take a look at the aardvark. See what that orange circle that I've got up there? The one where there should be a dotted line going to Afrotheria in this horribly inaccurate drawing that looks like it came right off the 1970s? Yes, I see it. Look underneath that. Do you see the dashed line? The dashed line just ends. Does it even connect with the, anything else? Not on that ancient diagram, but it does in the new ones, because genetics have demonstrated that the aardvark is the basal most branching member of Afroinceptophilia, which includes things like the golden mole, the tenrec, and the elephant shrew. And that group is sister to Panunculata, which includes the hyrax, elephants, dugongs, and manatees. I'm sorry that a chart from decades ago before the studies were done wasn't sure what to do with aardvarks, but the fact that there was an open question about aardvarks from decades ago doesn't present a problem for evolution. No. What this chart is showing you is that thing just appeared. No, it's showing you that at the time of this chart being made, the phylogenetic status of the aardvark was as yet unresolved. It has since been, and I promise that if this guy decided to go look at a modern cladogram of Afrotheria, with the aardvark right where it should be, that he'd just ignore the lines connecting it to other Afrotheres anyway. Pretending that this chart is evidence against evolution is disingenuous, since he's decided that this type of chart wouldn't be evidence for evolution with the connection he's complaining about being absent. Uh, and by the way, don't feel bad for the aardvark. Yeah, aardvark's one of our ancestors. Man descended from early aardvark. How many times do I have to say to never get your science from pop sci articles, and especially not from the headline. But oh well, let's see what the actual article says before he lies about it. Oh look, it says that aardvarks seem to have the least derived genome of extant eutherians in terms of chromosome structure. That's a far cry from humans evolving from aardvarks. Does he know that he's allowed to actually check the articles? That is something he wouldn't have to go past paragraph 2 to figure out. Every mammal, including man, is descended from a creature that was genetically similar to the modern aardvark scientists have found. So, so don't feel bad, the aardvark's one of our ancestors. Not even that poorly titled article is making that argument. 
You don't like that. Okay, let's go beyond the aardvark. Let's go back even further. You'll like this even less. When microbiologist Mitchell Sogan decided to trace human evolution to its roots, he had no idea he might find, wait for it, sponges. He probably should have, since sponges are the simplest, least derived, and probably most basally branching of all animals. A prediction of evolution is that the common ancestor of all animals looked a bit like a modern sponge. Yes, we evolved from the sponge. And by the way, gentlemen, we know this is true because of athlete's foot. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the f did you just say? Athlete's foot? I can't wait to figure out what foot fungus has to do with porphyrins, aka sponges. Very difficult to get rid of, right? And that's because uh, it's a fungus, and when you're trying to kill off this fungus, you're killing off some of your heritage. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. I'm sorry, is this man saying that fungus are sponges? I can't even begin to explain how wrong that is. We're not even in the right kingdom here. Fungi are an entirely separate kingdom from animals, and sponges are animals. A sponge is no more closely related to a foot fungus than the human on which it grows. I just read it in the newspaper. That's what they said. It's like, why, why so hard? And by the way... The newspaper told him that athlete's foot is caused by a sponge and that sponges are fungi. I call bullshit. That absolutely did not happen, ever. He is simply lying. Uh, I, I actually have a picture of our uh, late... Great, 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 about 30 more minutes of greats, uh, grandmother and grandfather all rolled into one. Uh, there it is. At least that is actually a picture of some sponges and not fungus. At this point, he makes a SpongeBob joke. I'm not letting him use his cringy boomer humor after being that blatantly dishonest. But Carl, Carl, everybody knows, ape-like ancestor, given enough time, right circumstances, all the... That's another episode. We will address that. Oh, goody. Maybe I'll be here for that. No promises, though. Let's jump back into the fossils for this is a good one. Ooh, protocetids and archaeocetids. Fun times. Interestingly, young earth creationist Todd Wood holds that all whales, these guys included, may actually be descended from a single pair of animals that got off of Noah's Ark. I personally think that's a whole lot of evolution to happen in a few hundred years, but hey, it's not my pro-evolution, anti-evolution idea. It's his. The wolf-like animal that went back into the ocean to become the whale. By the way, this is from Denver Museum of Natural History. I'm telling you guys. Real cool place. I've been there several times. These zoos, these museums, these aquariums, your tax dollars pay for them. You know what's cool about nonprofits like museums? You can see their financials. In 2020, the museum took in $41,393,000, of which $9,365,000 was from the government. That means that 22.6 of the museum's funding was from the government. But that was 2020, a year that, as the museum notes, was really weird, and they had very low attendance due to COVID-19. But let's take a look at the 2019 numbers. So they took in 53,153,000, of which 9,477,000 was from the government. So about 17.9% of their budget was from the government. Now, $9 million isn't chump change, but when your typical income is in the 50 million range, if you've lost that, it's not exactly going to break the bank. I'm pretty confident that if the museum lost all government support, that it would survive just fine. And I'm also pretty confident that if the public of Colorado really, really didn't want to fund the museum, they could get that done. And at the risk of whataboutism, I feel like even if you think the government shouldn't fund museums generally, it's a much, much lesser evil than many of the things the U.S. government has paid for, like bombing a Doctors Without Borders hospital. You need to take the word of God in there, use their exhibits that your tax dollars pay for that are used to deceive millions. No one is being deceived by this display, and your tax money is only going to this museum if you live in Colorado. Further, admissions in 2019 made up $12,218,000 of revenue for the museum, and the mean ticket price is $21, which means that even if you include memberships, you're unlikely to get to even 2 million visitors to the museum in a year. I know this is nitpicking a bit, but like... The numbers are all public. He could have just checked. And quite frankly, after him saying that Morganucodon is the common ancestor of Boreo eutheria and that fungi are sponges, I'm out of charity for this nutcase. 
you need to walk in there and lead towards because these things are great ministry. Yeah, I'm sure that uneducated buffoons who can't tell the difference between a rat and a shrew would make for great tour guides in a natural history museum. Well, there it is. Looky there, Carl. That, that, that proves evolution. You got this wolf-like animal that slowly, gradually goes back into the ocean to become a blue whale. And I mean, we have all the pictures on the wall. Which again, is a story that even young earth creationists who know more than this guy think is actually plausible within their own framework. So Carl, take it up with Dr. Todd Wood of the Core Academy of Sciences, a young earth creationist. Yeah, look at all the evidence to support it. You've got one, two, three, you got like four, five pieces of fossil up there. You know, museum displays aren't the repository for fossils. The actual fossils that lead up to the conclusions that are illustrated are much more numerous than what's included on this sign for non-experts. There are far more than four fossils involved in tracing the history of whale evolution. And by the way, if you want to dig into the fossil record of the whale evolution, get with me. We'll do it. You don't need to be afraid of it. I am spectacularly not afraid of fossils, as it turns out. Oh, but Carl, I saw it at the Smithsonian. We have video too. This wolf-like animal slowly, gradually, over millions of years, tiny mutations slowly, gradually. Whoa, 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 what just happened there? That's some big changes, man. What happened there is what's called a whip pan transition, in which the transition between two shots is hidden by the motion of a rapid camera pan. It's a pretty famous film technique and has been used to do things such as hide the transition between shots and make them seem like they're the same shot. Here's an example from the movie Tremors, in which we cut from a miniature of the monster wrecking up Burt Gummer's basement to a shot of him getting his weapons, which of course was shot full scale, with the actual actor Michael Gross. In the museum animation, it was done because the animators didn't actually make a transition between one mesh and the other for the character models. Instead, they used two entirely separate models. Now, I think that rather defeats the purpose of having an animation illustrating the evolution of protocedids, but hey, the museum didn't hire me for this, so what can I say? However, the two models shown aren't really that dissimilar. The second one is a different color, and it has shorter limbs that are a bit farther from the central line of the body, but that's it. That's the kind of thing creationists often call variation within a kind, and remember, Carl here accepts that. Slowly, gradually, over millions of years, wolf-like animal, whoa, whoa, what just happened there? That's some big changes. What happened there is that a bubble animation was used to hide another cut between shots. And yes, those are some big changes going from something like Ambulocetus to something like Dorudon. Unfortunately, it skipped over the morphological intermediates that we have between these, such as Remington Acetids and Protocetids. If they had been included, it would have been a much less abrupt transition. If I were grading this animation for educational value, it'd probably get a D at best. Slowly, gradually, over millions of years. Did you catch that? I did. We went from a Dorodon-like form to an Orca. But again, that skips over intermediates we have, such as Bacillosaurids. But also again, that is a pretty minor change that seems to fall well within the variation within a kind that creationists like to pretend that they can define. As stated, that's far less evolution than Todd Wood would allow. I'm not sure what the problem is here. Guys, that doesn't support what the evidence shows. It doesn't. Yes, because only a moron would think that CGI animation from a museum is evidence. It's an illustration of the conclusions scientists have reached based on the evidence. And on top of that, it doesn't even illustrate all the morphological stages that we have in the fossil record. It skipped about half of them at least. Now, it makes a cool story, and it's a great illusion. Oh, by the way, I like illusions. Yes. Um... Which part is the illusion, other than the shot transitions? I don't see it. Does Mr. Kirby here think that this animation with like PlayStation 2 graphics is supposed to be fooling us into thinking it's actual footage from the past? Even if it's not true, it's not an illusion. Then he tells the story of him being at a magic show and being an audience volunteer. I don't see why it matters, so it's out of here. So let's take a look at the actual evidence. Oh hey look, despite what he was just saying, we have a chart with way more than four fossil taxa on it. Almost three times as many in fact. It's almost like we should have just gone straight to the literature in the first place. Too bad, though, that he's not citing this, so I could, you know, check up on the actual source. And even a reverse image search turned up nothing. So I have no idea where this is from. Nice. Hey, people can't call you out for misrepresenting your sources if you just don't give them, right? Here it is, the phylogenetic chart, showing how you start with a couple wolf-like animals, give it enough time, you get all the whales. This doesn't show you how it happened, it shows you a likely shape of the ancestral tree. How it happened is things like mutation, selection, and drift. This is the what, not the how, of this particular happening. By the way, does anything look interesting to you? Do you see the dashed lines? Do you see the question marks? 
Do you see the science proceeding as expected and not pretending they have found the actual ancestors when they almost certainly have not? To reference an earlier analogy, do you see the doctor just assuming that bacteria are attacking your throat tissues just because he cultured bacteria from your throat and you have a sore throat? So here we go. Now I'm going to do a magic trick for you. I got my own magic trick here. Nothing up my sleeves. I don't have any. You ready? Here we go. I want you to focus on the skulls. That's the actual evidence. That's what we found. Focus on those skulls. Focus. Focus. Okay, and when I do, I still see clear patterns of skulls becoming more and more derived as I go forward in time, which is up on the y-axis. In fact, I can see clear divisions by about the midway point into baleen and tooth whales, even in this low-res image. I can also see the much more basal skulls toward the bottom. It's not hard to see why this represents clear evidence of evolution. Did I change the skulls? No. They're exactly in the exact same place that they were before, because these are the facts. Yep, and they still clearly indicate evolution. Nice. And God said, which needs to become the rallying cry of every Christian, God said that he created whales on day five. And the ancient Greeks said that they were sea monsters created by Poseidon who fought Perseus. Guess how much that matters to science? Exactly zero. Literally nothing in an ancient bit of literature is of relevance to evolutionary biology. What do I see in the fossil record? Cetaceans are predicted intermediate morphology spending tens of millions of years while becoming increasingly derived from their basal artiodactyl ancestors leading up to the modern tooth and baleen whales. With my chart, do I need question marks? Yes, because none of it is actually based on anything. Does he have numbers? Does he have any actual character traits? Genetic analysis? Nope. Just pure speculation based on one sentence in an ancient book. If the uncertainty from the earlier cladogram was unacceptable, then this is complete nonsense. Do I need dashed lines? Again, yes, because there is no actual evidence presented here. No. Yes. What I see in the world is consistent with what I read in the Word of God. But, 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 Carl, you're showing one thing splitting into another thing. That's evolution. Yep, and he's cutting it off arbitrarily because the only way he can decide that some of these organisms share a common ancestor with others is by doing the same kind of thing that actual evolutionary biologists do when they construct their own phylogenies and cladograms. The difference is that one, they have the actual expertise, and two, he just decides arbitrarily to stop doing that kind of work when it makes him uncomfortable. No, that's speciation. And speciation is the minimum amount of evolution that counts as macroevolution. So congrats, Carl. You're now an evolutionist who accepts macroevolution. And creationists, Christians, we absolutely believe that. Weird, because they spend a lot of time saying that they don't. Maybe they just don't know what evolution is, by and large. You started with two dogs, you got all the different look looking dogs that we see today. Okay, so why not, as Todd Wood is okay with, you started with two cetaceans and got all the cetaceans we have today. Same thing is true here. This is not getting something from nothing. This is not a wolf turning into a whale. Well, no one thinks evolution starts with nothing, nor that wolves evolved into whales. So I guess we're still in the realm of nothing contradicting common ancestry for all whales, and he shouldn't really be objecting to any of this. So what we see in the world is consistent with God's word. But, but, but Carl, Fossils provide the only historical documentary evidence that life has evolved. What are we going to do with it? You know what we're going to do? Let's go read a couple quotes from non-Christians here. Take a listen. Place your bets now for if he's going to break with tradition and actually present these quotations to mean what the original author meant in context, or if they're going to be quote lines. Why is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. Hey, that's Darwin from The Origin of Species. Fortunately for him, intermediates were found only a few years after he wrote that, and since then we have a plethora of such fossil forms. But at least, technically yes, Darwin was presenting the then paucity of fossils as a problem for the acceptance of his ideas. Where are those transitional fossils? In museums. Here are some of them.
oh, you'll be told that there's lots of them, lots of them. Really? Yeah, I just did a nice little video montage of only some of them. By the way, do you know who made that quote? It's in a book that you might be f familiar with called Origin of Species. Yep, I did know that. That's why I recognized it before he said where it was from. Huh. Charles Darwin made that quote, and I'm telling you right now, things have not changed that much. Yes, there's a whole lot more fossils, no doubt about it. A bunch of them transitional. But when it comes down to showing this thing turning into this thing... Like a basal arctoidean turning into a seal? Or a basal wizard turning into a snake? Or like a predatory hoofed animal turning into a whale? Or like an arboreal ape turning into a terrestrial biped like a human? Or like a dinosaur becoming a bird? Or like a small four-toed forest animal becoming a horse? Or like a basic marginal cephalian dinosaur becoming a neoceratopsian? Or like a worm becoming a vertebrate? Or like a basic fish becoming a seahorse? Oh, whoops. That's not a fossil. That's still around. I think you get the idea. Do you still need question marks? You still need dash lines? You still need different colored lines? Weird how I've managed to show so many transitional fossils then. Here's the truth. Here's another non-Christian. This is a non-Christian quote here. Instead of finding the slow, smooth, and progressive changes Lyell and Darwin had expected, they saw... F oh, hey, look. A book review about punctuated equilibrium pointing out how the fossil record is inconsistent with young earth creationism and mentioning progressive creation instead. Before then, going on to talk about punctuated equilibrium. How shocking. Well, that's one and one for quote minds. The Darwin quote did actually mean what Carl wanted it to, even if it is now a century and a half out of date. But this one didn't. They saw in the fossil record rapid burst of change, new species appearing seemingly out of nowhere, and then remaining unchanged for millions of years. Now, please read this last quote along with me. Patterns hauntingly reminiscent of creation. Progressive creation over millions of years, though. Even if this quote did mean what Carl wants it to, it wouldn't help him very much. He'd still be laughably wrong about almost everything he said so far. Hold up. So the non-Christian looks at the evidence, and he says it supports creation. First, I have no idea what Mark Pagel's religious position is. The most I can say is that he once appeared on an atheist podcast, but many non-atheists do that, so who knows. But second, he said not that it appeared currently, or to him, to be consistent with creation, but that it appeared to the late 19th and early 20th century paleontologists that it was consistent with progressive creation. I agree. No, he doesn't, because he doesn't even know what Dr. Pagel was saying. Or he does, and he's lying about it. After this, it's a bad comedy sketch based on the Mac and PC commercials from years ago. It makes no point. Then he decides to base a point on Kung Fu Panda? For some reason? Basically, the point made is that peach seeds grow into peaches, since that's expected by both evolution and creationism. I don't know why I should care. And that's exactly what the fossil record shows. There's some diversity within kinds, absolutely no argument about it. Oh man, too bad we never got a set of objective criteria by which we could decide if we have a kind or not, or what it would look like if an animal crossed from one kind to another. Oh, but one last, one last example. How about the supposed shrew-like animal? Why am I seeing a pterosaur, a reptile, while hearing about shrews, which are mammals? This does not bode well. That slowly, gradually over time evolved into the bat. Is he implying that that obviously pterosaur skeleton is a bat? Okay, look, here's the skeleton of a bat and a pterosaur. I don't think you need a deep knowledge of comparative anatomy to know that these are not the same group of animals. See, days like this, I wish I had a table to flip. But my table is way in the back, and there really isn't anything on it. I mean, we're not even going to attempt to deal with uh, the flying reptiles with the uh, 20 foot long pinky fingers. Forget about that. But he's just going to put one on screen, I guess. Let's just deal with the shrew like animal that evolved into the bat. Let's take a look at their chart. And here we go. You start here, given enough time, right circumstances. You've got some mutations, tiny changes, tiny changes, mutation, tiny change. And eventually, looky there, looky there. You get yourself a bat. How are you going to argue against that, Carl? Well, since Carl doesn't know the difference between a freaking pterosaur and a bat, my guess is poorly. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to use their chart. Please, look at the actual chart. You know, I'd love to use that same chart, but it's not cited. And the last time I tried to find one of his unsighted charts, I couldn't. As a result, I'm just going to assume that this isn't a chart that any real specialist made. 
and that he pulled it out of his ass like he has with so much of this talk. Especially when he said that fungi are animals. And by the way, notice uh, Protictus. Yep, it's not hard to spot. What was the actual evidence found to support it? Based on this chart, which again, I have no reason to take seriously, the anterior portion of the cranium and the mandible. And also based on every single paper I can find about Protictus, it's a ferungulate, not a chiropterin. So it looks like no one is suggesting that it's a bat ancestor. Which makes me even more suspicious of this chart. As a result of my suspicions, I looked into pseudoscience websites, and oh <laughs> this nonsense is from David Peters, known quack. No one takes him seriously, whether creationist or scientist. He is an absolute loon who thinks that JPEG compression artifacts and tool marks are parts of fossils, and gets extremely ornery if anyone points out how full of crap he is. In fact, if you Google image search Protictus, the majority of illustrations are from Peters. This is at least as bad as presenting the work of a fellow young earth creationist and pretending it's coming from mainstream science. You notice how the whole body is black? You notice how no one who knows what they're talking about thinks that Protictus is related to bats? And all they found is a piece of a skull? Yep, already covered it. And this is the thing that's supposedly transitioning from the shrew to the bat, getting the longer fingers, slowly, gradually, the fingers are getting longer. Did they even find a finger bone? Nope, and no one in the field proposes that this is a transitional bat in the first place. No, this is not an evidence problem. It's a problem that Carl is too incompetent to not know that David Peters is off his rocker. This is a spiritual problem. Maybe, but after quite a bit of digging, I couldn't figure out David Peters' religion. Maybe he really does have the wrong one, and that's why he's a nutter. Now, I got a bat challenge for you. Yeah, I do. I got a bat challenge. You ready for this? I don't even know what that is, so probably not. Here's our bat challenge. Stick with me. You are evolving and no longer able to use your front paws for digging up or catching worms, grubs, insects, or small rodents. Okay, that's a problem. It gets worse. In addition, your partially formed wings can't take flight yet in order to catch flying insects. So here's the bat challenge. If you don't eat two to 300% of your body weight each day by eating every two to three hours, you starve to death within five hours. So you can't run to get food to eat. You can't fly to get food to eat. And if you don't eat, you're gonna die. So how do you survive that transitional phase when you got your long pinky finger? You can't run with it, you can't fly with it. How do you survive? Well, the long pinky is pterosaurs, which again, are not bats. I honestly can't believe I have to say this. But let's see, why do bats have such insanely high metabolisms? Oh right, it's so that they can fly. So the non-flying ancestors of bats should have lower metabolisms. So they don't need to eat nearly as much per unit time to avoid starvation. Second, are there animals today that can't fly, but use the skin between their fingers and between their wrists and ankles to glide? Why yes, we have flying squirrels, colugos, and sugar gliders. Weird how all of them can manage to use their hands. Also, I should point out that bats absolutely can move on the ground with their forelimbs. Here's my bat challenge. How much about bats and bat evolution can one pastor get wrong in a minute? And the answer is, you don't. Right, you can't survive if you're a hypothetical creature made up to not be able to survive by a man who can't tell the difference between a flying fox and a pteranodon. Fortunately, if you're an actual protobat, as expected from evolution, you do pretty well. You know, I love this quote here. It says, the primary problem is not to provide the public with the knowledge of how far it is to the nearest star and what genes are made of. Rather, the problem is to get them to reject irrational and supernatural explanations of the world, the demons that exist only in their imaginations, and to accept a social and intellectual apparatus. Science is the only begetter of truth. Yeah, I disagree with Dr. Lewinton. That's scientism, and it's dumb. Science is not the only way to get at truth. If it were, we'd have to abandon mathematics, and then science would be a bit of a pickle given how much it relies on math. Also, history would have to go right out the window, too. Guys, have you noticed that everything that we've seen is absolutely supernatural? I have not noticed that, no. Because if it was natural, there should be evidence, but there's no evidence for it. Well, except for the mountains of evidence he's misrepresented or ignored. That's why you need dashed lines, different colored lines, and small lines. Oh, I forgot. 
Carl Kirby not knowing how science works means that it's wrong. How silly of me. He continues, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. Hang on. Science is certainly not obliged to follow common sense, and often doesn't. I'm not sure why that is a point against the supernatural, but then I'm not here to defend Dr. Lewinton's every position. Hang on. Watch this. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. And assuming that quotation isn't just mine, and it's actually what Dr. Lewinton meant, I disagree with him. I accept science because it is the most rigorous conclusion about the subjects it covers that is available. That is, it is the least wrong option that humans can take in realms relevant to science. Not all realms are covered by science. As I already pointed out, math is quite independent of science, and history only needs to be scientifically plausible. It does not depend on science. As for a commitment to materialism, scientists do not need to make a commitment to philosophical naturalism, but in order for their work in science to be testable, repeatable, and falsifiable, they do need to rely on methodological naturalism. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated, moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Okay, more of the Lewinton quote, I don't really care to defend. And that's it. That's the last bit that isn't directly preaching to follow Jesus, which I'm perfectly happy for you to do, as long as you don't do as was done here and get the science badly wrong. And especially as long as you don't try to influence others to also get it badly wrong. Well, this was much longer than I expected based on the length of the original video, but then I also didn't expect to get such hot takes that fungi are animals, that Morganucodon is the ancestor of Boreo eutheria, or that pterosaurs are bats. Well, I hope you enjoyed the series. I certainly didn't enjoy making it all that much, but I suffer for you. Kind of like Jesus. Anyway, if you like this, make sure you hit the like button. If you didn't, hit dislike and complain in the comments. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're always notified when I put out more content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I just want to take a minute to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Ben Hovind, Denny525, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Landon Knoll, Lingue, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Patrick Dennis. My channel members and patrons help keep the lights on here at Casa Dino, and they also help make this channel possible, because without them, you'd be lucky to get one video a week out of me, never mind three. If you'd like to support either as a patron or a channel member, there are links below. Also, if a monthly pledge or even an annual pledge isn't right for you, there are other ways you can support the channel. There's a merch store and an Amazon wishlist. And of course, if none of that's right for you, just hitting like, sharing this video, and commenting really helps out a lot. Thank you.